So my interest in outward triads really began years ago um, when I was a, was I was a schoolboy. I mean, yeah, I suppose what you would call it. I was at high school, and uh, uh, there was a program on television at that time called The Sea of Faith. Uh, by Don Cupid. You may have heard of Don Cupid, and he was for a while a colleague of mine. He's a sort of post-Christian Christian, and uh, he called himself, I think, a Buddhist Christian. But on this programme, he uh, um, had a number, there were a number of parts to it, and in one part, he uh, looked at Schweitzer, and I was fascinated by Schweitzer, not least because he seemed to have achieved so much in so many different um, areas. And so um, I thought, well, this is a interesting person. So I went and read The Quest of the Historical Jesus, I went and read The Mysticism of Paul the Apostle, I went and read his uh, biography, um, which he never, which, which he published in 1930, but never supplemented really. Um, and then I became more interested because in the, in the period, in the late 1980s, of moving forward, um, a lot of work that he never published, for various complicated reasons, um, came to be published. Um, uh, the so-called Nutclass of Albert Schweitzer, which C. H. Beck of Munich published, um, ten volumes it runs to, plus a volume of fascinating letters between him and his wife to be, his fiance, um, over a period of about thirteen years, which revealed a very different Albert Schweitzer from the one that he presented in his um, autobiography, a much more passionate and at times slightly batty figure. Uh, and so I uh, thought that you know the time had come to take account of some of this extra material. Uh, some of it did relate to the New Testament, so uh, quite a lot of material um, on which, which consisted of lectures he'd given when he was working in Strasbourg before he went to Africa, um, including a whole body of lectures that he gave on the mysticism of Paul the Apostle. I think some people forget that he'd basically written the book by 1910. Um, but for complicated reasons only wrote it in 1930. One of the most interesting things is why he bothered in 1930. He was no longer going to pursue a career as a New Testament scholar. Um, but I think he felt that it was important to get it out there, um, partly because I think he felt that what he was doing was very different from what Karl Barth was doing. I think that Schweitzer, one of the things I've wanted to argue um, in various places is that Schweitzer was more affected by Karl Barth than some of wanted to argue, but in a negative way. I mean, he was strongly opposed to aspects of, of Karl Barth's uh, theology. Schweitzer was a kind of um, romantic rationalist of a certain kind, and I think he saw um, elements of Barthianism as, 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 as rather rebarbative. And when, for instance, he calls Paul the patron saint of Christian thought, I think there's a, a certain barbed element to that that he's, and when, of course, he calls his book The Mysticism of Paul the Apostle, um, though, of course, this is, a, this is something he's come up with previously, uh, mysticism is something that Karl Barth really doesn't like. Uh, Karl Barth, as you know, is much more about the word, uh, you know, and uh, about the otherness of God, not about something called mysticism. So I think, um, I think Schweitzer was affected by wider theological currents when he wrote, um, and that's the case too in the Quest of the Historical Jesus. So I've been interested not simply in Albert Schweitzer's New Testament um, ideas, which I think in their particularity are probably not always right, but in their, um, in what I might call their impulses is more or less right. I think most people would now think that Jesus was an eschatological prophet and most people now would think that um, uh, his view of mysticism, the mysticism of all the possible, which we now, I suppose, would call participationism or something, is a, a central core. And many people would argue, through uh, E.P. Sanders, but E.P. Sanders himself much affected by Albert Schweitzer, um, uh, for a more integrated Jewish view of, of Paul. One of the striking things about Schweitzer's work is the extent to which he avoids complicated reasons, the supersessionism uh, of much German theology. Of course, he wasn't a German. He died a Frenchman, but was born a German, of course. And I was interested in the, in the influences upon Schweitzer, not least of Friedrich Nietzsche, who I think really influenced Schweitzer to quite a strong degree, um, uh, particularly in his ethical thinking. Um, in many ways, some of, some of the impulses of Nietzsche, Schweitzer adopted, um, but what he didn't like was Nietzsche's uh, he agreed with Nietzsche that ethics and human um, impulse and human need should go together. Ethics should not be something imposed from out, 
beyond us, outside us, it shouldn't be a command thing, but it should actually be something that comes from within us. His great argument with Nietzsche was that he didn't believe that the will to power was what naturally came out of us. Um, uh, he believed what naturally came out of us, if we thought hard about it, was reverence for life. And so he and Nietzsche had this complicated uh, relationship and he was more positive about Nietzsche before the Second World War, but I think in the light of the use of Nietzsche, that the Nazis made of Nietzsche, he became more, more negative. Um, so my, my, my work on Schweitzer has been partly cultural, uh, but also partly uh, based on the New Testament. I wrote a, an essay on the second edition of The Quest, where I tried to show how Schweitzer was affected by various um, publications between the first edition and the second edition in writing his own I've written on the background to the, to the mysticism of Paul the Apostle, but I've also written a bit about Schweitzer's um, own theological sentiments, and really the failure of Schweitzer to bring together in the way Rudolf Bultmann did, or indeed Paul Tillich to some extent, the, uh, his own um, theological views and his philosophical positions. He tends by and large to do philosophy and theology as almost separate entities, and I think would probably have called himself a philosopher. But um, uh, there is, it seems to me, a very strong correlation uh, between the two, and one can map on what he says about Jesus' eschatology onto reverence for life to some extent. So Schweitzer is a sort of case study of, uh, he was a great, I mean, one of the most fascinating things about him is the way he's now fallen from public consciousness. I mean, not in Germany and in Switzerland, but certainly in Britain. Many people don't know about him at all. I mention him to students and they look at me as though I'm... But if I spoke to my grandparents, who now sadly are dead, um, uh, they would have you know, known him in the 1950s. He was probably the best-known public intellectual in the world. Uh, but for various reasons, uh, um, his position, his, his standing has gone, has, 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 dis has been low. It was interesting when Obama received the uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize, rather strangely, you remember in 2009, I think it was, and he, he, he noted it was rather a strange thing. I always think it was a terrible error that he even accepted it. He would have done better not to. Uh, but uh, and accepted it perhaps at the end of his time, but probably wouldn't have got it then. Um, but he, he, um, he said that, you know, in relation to, let us say, uh, uh, Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela or indeed General Marshall, uh, or indeed Albert Schweitzer, and I was quite struck by the fact that Obama did mention Albert Schweitzer, but of course Obama is a rare thing, a, an American president who knows something about theology, um, and I think he was very much influenced by, by Norman Niebuhr and these people, but, uh, but, but he's a, it's a rare example of Schweitzer's name coming up in, in, in the public. This is a man who, as I say, in the 1950s was so popular that he even appeared, um, he even wrote an article for Playboy magazine, which I've got a copy of, but Sadly, not here for, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, and uh, you know, so he's a he's a he's he's a fascinating person, and he's also a fascinating person because he's an he became an icon after the war, and people projected upon him. So he becomes, as it were, a, a receptacle for some of the concerns that come out after the war. You know, Schweitzer seems to be utterly opposed to and a, a beacon of light against the kind of nihilism that comes out of the war. He's a good German. Um, he's someone we, you know. He he's also a good imperialist, um, as we try and think about uh, as, as we begin to leave empire. The Europeans begin to leave empire and think about their uh, heritage and what they've done there. Then Schweitzer looks like someone who's done something good, and of course this means that the view of him amongst African intellectuals is very ambivalent and quite negative, and that's also an interesting 